I will introduce the teams. Sarah, would you say hello to everybody? Introduce yourself, please. Hi, I'm Sarah Slain. I'm the homeowner. <laughs> Do you want more background about myself? Uh, well, is this your first home that you built? Uh, this is the first home that I've built uh, in Baltimore County. And so totally new to the process and um, look forward to kind of talking to you today. I, I was told I can be honest, so I can be very brutally be, honest. Yeah, I, oh. will, I will try to keep myself in check, but um, hopefully I can provide you with some background and insights from my experience. The rest of us won't be honest, just for the record. Um, did you have a lot of technology in the house you lived in before that, that you're moving out of? Uh, that no, okay. that would be a very easy answer. As I said earlier, I, did, I either don't roll in the right circles with people that have a lot of high technology in their okay. homes, but um, no, and I've kind of moved around the country as well. So I, I grew up in Ohio, I lived in Las Vegas, I live in Baltimore now. So I had kind of a good gamut of different architecture and home experiences. Right. And um, I would say that what has been really enlightening to me right now is just um, kind of, I think, thinking through and now looking backward, maybe things, decisions that could have been made on the front end that would have probably helped me in the long run. Great. Hey, let's switch to Greg. We have one person who could not make it, and that's Greg the Builder. Hey, Greg, say hello to everybody. Introduce yourself. Hello. Uh, I'm Greg. I'm the Vogel, the principal of Mollier Construction, and happen to be the builder uh, building Sarah's home. Fantastic. Thanks for coming. And we love the artwork from your kids behind you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to block the uh, angry, <laughs> whatever angry that is man. there. Yeah. No, our first meeting, it's really, it's, it's great. So they've, they've had a lot of rain there. His office is out of power. So he's taking this from the home. Thank you for joining, Greg. Yep, Vince, absolutely. the architect. Say hello, me. Vince. Hi, my name is Vince Green. Uh, I run Vincent Green Architects out in Baltimore. Uh, we've been around for about 25 years now. We do mainly high-end residential construction, and uh, we were really happy and lucky to be part of this team. This was a, this is a great project. It's almost almost complete at this point. Awesome. But uh, the fun part for you guys today is that you, I get to be the punching bag for <laughs> for the builder community because, um, like a lot of architects, we're we're behind the curve and we're trying to do better. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, something that you know, as builders, be uh, proactive with your client and your art, the architect and make, you'll see some recommendations here that you might be able to use to help get those conversations going early. And uh, I'm gonna hand the clicker to Sean. Sean, say hello to the group, introduce yourself and then take it away. Hi, uh, I, th I'm, I think a lot of you have been here before and seen me, but I'm uh, one of the original founders of Brabus. We're a, a national integrator and my job and our job as Brabus is to pull together all these pieces of these electronic system installations and to get Folks like Sarah educated earlier, and the, and the point of this conversation today is to explain that we didn't do a very good job of that with you, um, but we didn't do a terrible job either. So um, I've been sort of shouting from the mountaintops for a long time that technology is an important part of the construction process, and we've always been brought in sort of toward the end of the conversation or in the middle of it at the very best. Um, and Vince and I have known each other for probably 20 years now, mm -hmm. um, and I think Vince has always been good about getting us in early, but I think hopefully recently you've seen more reasons why, yeah. and that's what we want to share with you today. Great. All right, let's kick it off. Awesome. So you don't have to read all these, uh, these little circles on this diagram, but this is sort of the way that uh, traditionally I've experienced uh, being an integrator. So that's the construction process of deciding to build a house, engaging with an architect, going through some schematic design process, which these two did together. And please feel free to interject, it didn't work out that way. Um, but once you had that schematic design together, um, and you start to enter that design development phase, there's, there's trades or designers that are brought into the conversation. Sometimes there's a lighting designer, sometimes there's a lighting showroom, sometimes there's a landscape uh, architect, there's an interior design team or an interior designer, um, and they're involved in that, in that step between schematic design and full design development and construction documents being issued. I like to call this death by a thousand cuts because every, every single time it was like, really is this more money that I have to pay someone else to tell me what to do? Like it's a very, just uh, this is a great, articulation sort of of the process and how overwhelming it can be. So Vince, I, I mean, I, this is a good time to ask you, did, did you bring these designers to the, the table? Did you bring them yourself? Was it a combination of the two? When did you introduce these people? It was a, it was a combination. Um, oftentimes when we start a project, uh, the client will actually bring a designer along. Uh, this one happened pretty early on. So we had a designer uh, who frankly, I would say, you know, the designer and our office got along very well 
but neither one of our offices were you know, into tech the way that we probably should have been. And so while we were focusing on the basics of the schematic design, we probably could have run over three or four different categories that would have put us you know, a few months ahead in what we were trying to do for Sarah, which we're, what we're trying to do on the end of the project now. Great. So after that construction set is, is built, in theory, you're, you're, you're uh, putting it out to builders for bid. Uh, you're getting pricing back from those builders based on the specifications you develop. Um, and then those yellow circles are when the builder's now talking to his trades and subcontractors, which would be electric, plumbing, mechanical for the most part. And, and the forward-thinking builders, including Greg in this particular conversation, bring in at least a portion of the technology into that budget. Um, but, sir, I think you can, you can testify to the fact that we didn't have everything covered in that before you met me, um, which means that we don't get to the party as the integrator uh, until after that. So what happened? or Where, where, where do you think it could have gotten better? Yeah, and, and, and Greg can add to this as well. And, and I, I talked to him after the process, and I think it's everyone's sort of put in this position of not really knowing until you know, until you have the conversation. So he can put a budget number in there, but until I kind of walk through it and say, well, this is actually what I want, or this is how I want things to be developed and designed, and you just don't know until you go through that process that we, we did later on. And so I think to your point, you know, having that happen at the beginning of the process probably makes a lot of sense. And again, I'm a novice. Like, this is the first home I've ever built. You know, I, I was very fortunate. I started with Greg as my builder. He made recommendations. I have an amazing team of people that I work with from designer to architect to you, you know, and I'm leaning on you to tell me what I need to do. Now, it's ultimately my choice. I get it. But I feel like it's just sometimes it feels a lot like a piecemeal kind of process. Hey, quick question. So, Greg, um, do you put a budget or an allowance for technology in your initial discussion on budget? Uh, yes and no. So a lot of times um, the builder, or I in this case, will work with the architect or vents to develop some of the allowances in the house, because obviously every house needs tile and countertops and cabinets. And those kind of things are not even thought about or selected at the time that the budget is approved. Right. Um, you know, and when you are a builder bidding against other builders, you know, the, the architects will give you a, a, a specification sheet that they want everybody to follow. So they have an apples to apples. And unfortunately, this is kind of one of those phases that's just forgotten about. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a no harm, no foul type thing, but it's, it's just yeah. forgotten about. And, you know, Sean and I had this conversation that had I put a, an allowance in there that would have handled Sarah's needs, it would have thrown my number far over the other people bidding the job, right? right? So the other thing is, is throwing a big number in there like that in the, in the beginning, just as a, as a earmark, um, homeowners right off the bat are like, I don't need that. You know, when you're trying to value engineer the house down and get it within their budget, immediately they're going to say that, but not until they meet somebody like Sean who says, well, Sarah, you have 10 foot tall windows in your house. We, we might want to put some Lutron shades on those or right. what about security? What about cameras? You know, it's just, I think it's stuff that just gets lost. Yeah. Um, how about the audiences? Do, how many of you actually put an allowance to start the conversation about tech in the beginning? Yeah, so not a lot of hands are going up. I, that's one way to get the conversation going. And, and I don't know if it differentiates the builder who says, let's talk about tech. If the other builders didn't, you know, at some point, if you don't talk about certain things like uh, solid surface counters or radiant heat, you're going to say, well, well, we're, what kind of builder are you? So I think tech is becoming that. And it's a way to get, potentially a way to get the conversation going. Well, I, I want to push back can... on I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I want to push back yeah. on that a little bit. Sure. Because, uh, Vince, we talked about this earlier. Um, and I understand Greg's point completely, that as a builder, if there's three bids going in on a, on a Vince project, um, and one of the bids concludes $250,000 worth of technology, the other two don't, um, either a really progressive homeowner is going to say, hey, you're thinking about me, let's talk about this, or they're going to say, you're out of your mind, I don't want to work with you. Um, but if we brought it earlier to the party, where huh. Vince said, you know, the technology integrator is now a technology designer, um, and is part of the initial conversation, maybe That's right better. at somewhere between schematic design and design development, puts together an outline and a budget, um, a very detailed scope of what it includes, um, then that client, before they commit to a builder, or commit to a project, or commit to a budget, has an opportunity to review those things. I just said what you were probably going to say, but... Please say it again. 
<clears throat> what I was going to say is, I think the look, you guys know how it is at the beginning of a project, the psychology is, you know, you want, you're, you're just meeting the clients. You know, you're just putting the team together. You're learning about the designer. You're learning about all of the pieces and parts. And it's very difficult at that time, you know, to talk about a subject matter that might be a really big part of any budget. But along the line of what we've been saying here, I do think that it's important for us to, to start putting those plugins earlier on, even if they aren't exactly fleshed out yet, Sean, even if we don't know what all the answers are. Because for one thing, it makes the builder look good because it makes the builder look like they're progressive, that they know what they're doing, and I think that's a positive thing. The architect looks at it and says, well, you know what, if this is scary to Sarah or to my client, it's a pretty easy thing for us to take out cleanly. It's not like we have to change the stone you know, specification for all the countertops. It's a clean thing that we can pull out. So I do think that there's a, there's a time for it, but, it's, but for the architects and probably for builders too that start a project, the, finding the right time to talk about it is still, you know, uh, it's still something that we're working out. You know, with MEPT, we've got technology going into the plumbing. We've got water shut off. We've got leak detection. We got uh, smart circuit breakers on the electrical side. You've got renewable storage, EV charging. So tech's creeping into those things. Who's talking about that in the project? I mean, right now it's the integrator. Yeah. Um, we have, and, and you've probably seen it, and if not, we can show you later. We built a solutions guide that I think is now up to like 85 pages worth of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, which is a catalog that we ask our homeowners to read through or potential buyers to read through just to get an idea of all the things that we do. Um, so you can sort of rule out or rule in the things that are important to you. But to your point, there's so many things that are sort of intertwined and interwoven into a, the construction of a home now that didn't used to be. I mean, when I started doing this a billion years ago, um, I was the AV guy. I put speakers in the ceiling. You know, I ran some speaker wire and I ran some TV jacks and I put speakers in the ceiling. So I didn't need to be there until the end. We walked around, we pointed, we came out the next day with a truck and a couple spools of wire and a drill and we wired the house and we put the speakers in. Um, 30 years later, it's not that way at all anymore. And I think that um, there's a difference between the technology that you're gonna see here that I'd consider like smart technology, ring doorbells and Nest thermostats and connected stuff to apps. That's, that's all cool stuff. Um, we don't have to plan for a lot of that early on. The planning really is all the stuff that you just listed. And lighting. Right, lighting yeah. fixtures, lighting controls, and that's a huge thing for Vince and I right now, and for Sarah too, we'll touch on that. Yeah, great. But, but there's also a lot of things that homeowners don't even know are out there. Right. You know, until you actually tell them those 85 pages of things, yeah. they don't even know. And right. so we're leaving a lot on the table, even as builders, as, as you know, Sean with, Sean with Bravis, that if you don't put these things in front of the homeowner, you're not going to sell them, yeah. right? So it's yeah. good to get that out in front of them early on as well. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think when I think about the process that we went through, if it was if it had happened at the beginning to say like, because I, I understand it is a bit of a game, right? You guys have to go bid. You as a client, right? I'm going to probably go with maybe not the cheapest, but what what makes the most sense. But there is a big question mark around this piece of it, and to have sat down maybe in the beginning and said this is what this entails and encompasses and to get a feel and to your point, like you don't have to nail it down exactly, but just to get a feel for, are you going to lean Sarah a little bit more technology heavy or are you not? Are you, you know, we've, we've been going through this right now. I, I think again, it, on the front end probably would have been more helpful. I think for you, this was, this was somewhat of a surprise and no one likes expensive surprises. Yeah. Um, so I, we, we had a, an oh shit moment together, I yeah. think, where you yeah. saw everything. It was like, whoa, wait, what, what is all this? Yeah. So you, you said something, death by a thousand cuts. If, they're bring, if someone is introducing option after option over, the, over weeks and months, is that more painful than saying, let's talk about it up front, you can yeah. weigh all the things? Do you feel like people are trying to upsell you? To, no, I never felt, a, I mean, I, I trust and respect everyone that I work with, yeah. that I've hired, They're born, they've been wonderful. It, it just, it, feel, it felt... Um, you feel like you've come to your budget, it's like another thing. It just is, a, it's, yeah. I mean, I, again, I'm yeah. a novice, this is the first time I did it, I've built a home, I'm doing it on my own, like, you just don't realize sometimes how many little decisions that you have to make. Right. And people have told me that, but until you actually live it, you're like, oh wow, landscape architects and everything else. So. I think, again, just kind of on the front end, having said, okay, this is a big bucket that we need to talk about because it is right. part of your home. 
And as you think about your budget and you know where you start to cut things back or add things, how important is this to you? And you know, we again, we've been going through that and the oh shit moment, and it's like, yeah, but I really want all this stuff, and what am I willing then to kind of trade off? And had I known in the beginning, maybe I would have thought about it differently. I don't expect you to read this, um, but this was part of our lighting discussion on Sarah's project um, and who's involved in the lighting fixture discussions. And, and Sean, you mentioned to me that lighting was one of those pivot points where you really had to start bringing the team together and you got uh, involved, right? Yeah, so, and I think Vince will remember this and Greg definitely remembers this. There was a time when the lighting design conversation was a builder, a customer, maybe an architect, an electrician and maybe the designer participates and they walk around the house and point and say, I want three recessed lights in the ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, and the electrician says, well, I think they should go here and he nods their head and moves on to the next room. And that was a sophisticated lighting design and your options for fixtures were five inch Juno or six inch Juno cans. That was it. Um, we're not that way anymore. And, and we, we have all these things to consider, the size of the fixture, the shape of the fixture, um, the color temperature, and if it's adjustable or not, if it's a warm dim fixture, how it's gonna be controlled, where the controls go, um, and these decisions have to be made by the design team and by the, the homeowner. And what happens is, on your project, we had an interior designer, we had a lighting showroom, we had me, we had an electrical contractor, which was also me, um, we have a builder, and we have Vince doing the, the base lighting design. So everybody sort of had a hand in it, but hence all the check marks. And no one's really driving the bus except for you, and you're the one who's probably least interested in driving that bus because um, you just want someone to tell you what to do. Um, so Vince, I mean, you can describe this as well as I can. Yeah, no, it was uh, <clears throat> typically what happens in our, in our firm is that we, when we're working on a new house, it has a designer associated with it. The designer will take over the decorative lighting specifications, will sit down with us and tell us where the decorative lighting might be. And then our firm is usually responsible for the architectural lighting, so the recessed lighting, any of the other linear systems that we're using. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, the, diff the difficulty right now is that the architectural lighting is getting so complicated, as you guys know, so difficult, so multifaceted that the architects, builders, even the, even the designers that know what they're doing with it are just getting left. You know, we, we can't keep up with that. And so our firm, you know, through Sarah's job and other ones um, prior to that, has really taken a, a concerted effort to find integrators and find a way of delivering what we need to deliver on the architectural side to support the designer and the decorative side, but to do it with somebody, frankly, who knows what the technology is doing. Uh, you know, we were, we were laughing about it. I mean, I, all I ever hear about is my lights are flickering. You know, my, my, my clients will call and they'll say, why are my lights flickering? And, you know, honestly, you need to be an electrical engineer at this point to be able to understand all of these systems. So. Our part of it, what we're trying to do right now is find a way in our architectural firm where we can give the information to the client in the best way and frankly from people who know what they're talking about, not the architect who always claims to know what, what the right answers are and sometimes not the designer either. Yeah. The, the drivers and the dimmers and the fixtures are so important to get right and you know, I, I spent a little time in the field and the channel, the traditional lighting channel gets in the way because the designer comes up with a design and then the builder puts it to the electrician, the electrician goes to the rep, the rep plays funny games with the pricing and then one electrician who thinks he's getting higher pricing may value engineer the design and, 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 and lower the cost of one of the components and that's when you get your flicker. So it, it really is a complicated thing and, and about 40% now I think of integrators are in the lighting category, somewhere around there, maybe a little more. So it's... Uh, yeah. And it, it's unfortunate because the integration world, I can't speak for everyone, but it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to understand. And I, I have the benefit of being an electrical contractor as well as an integrator, so I have probably more of a background in lighting than, than most integrators just getting into the business. Right. Um, it's hard. I mean, it was hard before. It's really hard now, to your point. Yeah. Um, and there's so much more that light fixtures can do. Um, it's not just about getting light on the floor so you don't trip over the, the cat in the morning. It's about you know accenting architectural features and artwork and furnishings. And if it's not done, if it's not done right, it's a missed opportunity. So, Sean, is lighting a, is that a, gr a good entree for you to get involved early? Yeah, it's, it's probably the thing that needs to be talked about the earliest because it's the one that involves the most people mm -hmm. and, and the most information and the most ideas. I mean, we had. 
I won't get into too much detail, but you had an initial specification. I looked at it and said, hey, if we change the fixture type, I can get you better fixtures and lower cost controls and save you some money in the process. So I was essentially able to say to Sarah that we can give you a better system for less money, which is kind of a no-brainer, I think, um, in terms of the product. But now we still have to work on the locations and how we're going to adjust them and the furniture plans and all those things that sort of follow. So there's a lot of design discussions that happen along the way. Now, I get that the interior designer often helps select the decorative fixtures, right? Is there, um, is there complexity if you're putting in either a, you know, a, a fixed color light or an adjustable color light, and then you've got a decorative fixture with a different color light and a different way to dim? Is, I mean, I know you're not going to choose the decorative, but where do you need to be to make sure that your controls and the light color temperature for architectural and decorative work? Well, like at the end of the day, I'm not going to be picking decorative no. fixtures. So if there's opportunity to change the, the light source and the fixture, I can have that conversation with the interior designer. And if not, um, the adjustable color fixtures, I can match the color of the decorative fixture if I want to. Got it. It's not always the ideal thing. But you can also, w when you layer lighting in a design, right. Right, you, can t you can take the decorative fixture either down or off and then highlight and accent with the architectural right. cool. fixtures. Okay. All right. Didn't know we were having a lighting design discussion. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. So I want to talk a little bit about the architect's experience, and, and I think Vince, that doesn't really look like you. But that, that does look like me. But you're the coordinator. You've got to pull all this together. And I think that I, I think you already touched on some of these things, but I really wanted to point out how difficult your job is um, balancing this thing. It's, uh, I, I think we talked about the lighting and uh, controls a little bit. There are a couple other categories that I know all of you often run into with the architect as well, and that's motorized blinds, making sure that the structure is properly designed so it can accommodate that. We're, our office is doing that earlier and earlier now. We, um, once we get a schematic design done, we're immediately having a, a meeting with the structural engineer to make sure that all the framing plans will work with any potential tech uh, that needs to happen for motorized blinds. Another one is acoustics. Um, I know that you know this is another big issue that we have uh, in, in houses today because everything is so open and so live. Um, the problem, of course, is that we need to know where all of the loud sound sources are gonna be because we may be insulating between walls, we may be insulating between floors, we may be doing ex extensive things to make sure that you know, when the game is on downstairs that somebody can still sleep up above. Are so. you, are you, are you uh, from the work, of, work from home phenomena, mm -hmm. Are we insulating the offices to keep the kid noise out or yeah. keep privacy? Is that and even I would even say that we're designing Zoom backgrounds into houses now. So right. you know we it, it's a conversation that we have with almost every client lately, which is well you know where's my Zoom background going to be? What am I going to be looking at? You know all that. So that also tells us where the tech is going to go, but it may tell us uh, you know what view they want to have out a window or a or a built-in behind them. So there are a lot more categories that are touched by tech that we need to talk about earlier and earlier. That's a big part of it. And then I also think, as I've said earlier today, finding the right time within a relationship to have those conversations. <laughs> I think Sarah made a good point that you know, we should probably have that day one. We should say, are you interested in technology? These are some of the things that we see in our houses. Do you see yourselves being, you know, are you going to be wanting us to plan for those? That doesn't mean we have to even have a design yet at that point. And then once we have the schematic design done and we kind of know what the house is going to look like, then that's really, you know, where the, the, the branches need to reach out and where we need to bring the integrator in. We need to have a lighting design that we can stand behind. But finding the right times to do that amidst, you know, all of the worries that come with any homeowner trying to do a very complex project. That, I think, is one of the challenges that the residential architects still are trying to work out. If you need a source for Zoom backgrounds, I think Greg's got one. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll hire his kids. <laughs> um, Greg, this one's about you. I hope you can see the slide. Um, we touched on your experience a little bit and, and the, the frustration of being caught in the middle, I guess, of being stuck between uh, the, the integration of the sub, other subcontractors and trades, uh, the homeowner and the architect. So do you wanna, is there anything else you wanna add to that? No, I think you're right. Uh, you know, I do look towards the architect or Vince in this case to take the lead on, on the, you know, the build and helping getting the team together. Um, 
you know, there's only so much we know about what the homeowner wants in the early stages. And uh, all I can say is I, I welcome uh, a platform to be able to bring this to the table much, much earlier. Because in this case, yeah, Sarah was death by a thousand cuts. I mean, for her to, I mean, we had a, a conversation in her backyard. When can we start talking about the pool? And I had to say, Sarah, I think we need to get the lighting and control <laughs> and all that worked out in the house before you start thinking about your pool. Because, you know, unfortunately, with, with the list that she worked out with you and everything she wanted, you know, I knew that was going to be a big number. And I felt badly that I didn't have close to that in the budget for her home. We we had numbers in there for, for some shades. We had numbers in there for the easy stuff like audio and video, um, but not nearly the lighting control, um, the lighting systems. You know, and even with what you have taught me, Sean, with the way that some of these uh, lighting systems are wired now, that can make a difference in, you know, early on, am I going to bring 400 amp service to the house? Am I going to bring 600 amp service to the house? Because if she's going with something like Ketra or, or you know, something different than a, than a Juno light fixture, that's going to change the way the whole house is wired. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those are all things that I, again, I just did not realize until we kind of went through the process. And I do remember at the beginning, one of the things that I loved about Vince was he gave me, and you, I'm sure you still give this document out to all your clients, but it was like a timeline of who's involved in what, builder, architect, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. This is, it yeah. just, it, it helped me so much. And you know, my suggestion would be, okay, in that beginning of that process then, that this conversation occur with Sean, because to Greg's point, you know, once we did sit down and I had the, oh shit, oh my God, <laughs> like, whoa, I'm moment on how much this was all going to cost. Had I known kind of in the beginning of that and I prioritized to say, but this stuff is really important to me. I mean, we did generally kind of have a conversation about lighting. Like, I was like, lighting's important. Yes, it is. But it is. You know, it's like, you're going to build this beautiful multi-million dollar home, and I'm not going to stick a bunch of crappy lights in the ceiling. So just even having, like, here are considerations in technology, in lighting, in your AV, you know, a rough sketch around. And that's hard, too. I get it from a ballparking standpoint on, like, you know, here's what low end could cost. Here's what high end could cost. Just to have that as a frame of reference, I think, would have been really, really helpful. You, you know, interestingly, in, in product development, there's, there's a concept called design for manufacturing. And there are manufacturing engineers, and their job is to take look at the product and say, if you design it this way, you'll shave lots of money off yes. on the manufacturing process. Yes. And so that's a great point. If you have those conversations, like, don't wait until I get sheetrock up to put shade pockets in, yeah. right? I mean, it's that type of thing that... And, and I mean, look, like, you're all in the sales business. I mean, if you can turn around and say, here's going to be your ROI, because I think sometimes like you hear the word technology and you're like, expensive, <laughs> it's going to be expensive. But then you're, you know, you're like, look, this is what Sean was saying to me. He's like, you're going to make an investment, but in the long run, you know, you don't have to rip down walls again and put things back up or change things and your lighting and everything else. So I think that, again, like the beginning would be super helpful. All right. All right. Oh, Greg's still on the screen. Yeah. Sl could you get the slide deck up, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we like Greg. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I think you've already covered a lot of this stuff. But I think the important thing here is that, and you'll see on the next slide, too, that we, there, there's just opportunity for problems and cost overruns by not having this conversation earlier, right? So having to change things, move things, and you've done things outside of the technology scope that have changed along the way, and it's, it's the nature of construction. You decided you didn't want the spiral staircase, and now it's a bar. Um, I know that happens along the I way. I think that was a good choice. I think <laughs> everybody needs a bar, or so the staircase. Um, but those things happen along the course of the project. But generally speaking, I think that, uh, you know, to Joe's point a second ago, you don't want to be tearing down framing and drywall to add shade pockets. You decided you wanted shades late in the, late in the game. Mm -hmm. So th this is the integrator experience, and this is our side of it. And this is where there's some frustration here, too. And I think that everybody has one frustration in common, every, every one except for the homeowner, in that um, we all have a vested interest in the project. We all want to do what we do best. We all want to make money from what we're doing. 
Um, but there's other people that impact our ability to do that. And you just mentioned getting the builder into the conversation early. The reason the builder is not usually there early is because they haven't been selected because they haven't seen the pricing yet, right? And they don't want to bring you to the party yet because you might be the most expensive guy and your, your competitor might be cheaper and they might want to hire them. Um, and the same thing goes for the integrator. I and mean, the integrator becomes sort of a bid experience also where you know, it's a little bit different with you, Sarah, but in a lot of cases, I bring a nice idea to the table and the client says, this is great. And then they shop it to three other companies to see what their ideas were. And maybe it's the same uh, proposal with a different price on it. Maybe it's a whole different design from someone else. And that just creates another layer of confusion there. Um, and then Vince, you're faced with, well, you haven't picked a builder and you haven't picked an integrator, so I don't really know what to do yet uh, or who I'm working with on this project. And everything comes to a, not really necessarily a screeching halt. But now Greg's faced with, well, how much of this, once I get the job, how much can I actually proceed with? Like, how many things should I build without knowing what the lighting design or the lighting plan is going to be? Um, do, I, do I build, do I frame this ceiling around this lighting plan or the other guy's lighting plan because I haven't picked one yet? Do I, uh, do I design for shade pockets? Um, and I'm sitting on the sidelines waiting for someone to say, you know, do we trust you and we want to hire you and, and go before I can give any, any real feedback and say, not just this is what we think you should do, but this is what we're actually doing. Um, and I think you probably experienced the same things, and you probably experienced that during this process. Um, you, had a, you had a bid from a lighting showroom yeah. for the fixtures. It was just a list, a spreadsheet with 138 I, I had no idea. What, I was like, what is this? <laughs> what does this even mean? I and, think the other thing, too, is just, you know, and, and, I, and I am, I'm in the consultant business, so I understand sometimes that's a hard sell to people. Like, you're going to bring someone else in, and I hired you, Vince, and I've hired you, Greg. Like, why can't you guys just make these decisions for me? It, that, that's what I'm saying too from like the death of a thousand cuts, but it, it really is so important and so beneficial to have the expertise and my, I mean, that's my experience now is that, you know, I would have done it in a heartbeat. Um, it just, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. I think the takeaway is that the, the ideal experience, take out the bidding process and the, and all this other stuff is to have a design team yeah. early in the process, which includes typically an architect, hopefully the builder, if the builder has already been contracted. <clears throat> Uh, your integrator, and if there's a mechanical, electrical, or plumbing engineer somewhere in that too. Like that. So, so it's a lot of it sounds like you know it, it should start with the architect, and as a builder, if the architect didn't bring these things to the table, um, what should the builder do? How does the builder communicate to the homeowner that you know we should be th we should bring we should we should start doing this, right? I mean, what's how's that work? What what? What I would probably say is, first of all, I agree with you that you know over the over the course of our firm's history, the best projects that we've worked on were always projects that had the builder as part of the team at the very beginning, and this was this was a similar experience. So, I've worked in design build um, scenarios before, you know, worked for contractors. So I, I understand the benefits that come with that, and I always every time try and get the client to assemble a team. That's the first best thing mm -hmm. I try and tell them. Mm -hmm. but when that doesn't happen, I think the, 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 the takeaways that I get from all of this are, frankly, the architects just need to be, A, more courageous about being okay to talk about mm -hmm. tech, even if it's a scary budget topic. And second of all, don't pretend that you have to know it all. Mm -hmm. Don't be the person, like, like Sean was saying, if nobody is making decisions, if we don't have a builder, we don't have an integrator yet, the architects shouldn't be saying to themselves, well, I guess I'm going to have to do it, because they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They just don't know what they're doing. And they need to be open, you know, with themselves and I think with the, with the industry and say, you know, we need help with this. And even if we need to go hire an integrator and pay an integrator independently because we don't have a contractor on the job yet, just to get the numbers in, do it. You know, just do it. Mm -hmm. It takes it takes courage, and it's a mm -hmm. it's a difficult thing in my profession. I see a lot of a lot of cases where um, people are just afraid, you know, to a give up power, mm -hmm. and b to be the one holding the bag when all of the money talk happens. So technology design is an evolving uh, concept. You know, in essence, your architect is a designer and he's contracted or she's contracted to do the design. Your interior designers work similarly, um, lighting designers. Um, what's, the, what's, the, what's the conversation to get a design up front before you actually choose uh, an installer? I mean, what's the value of that? So it's actually interesting how the industry's changed in the last couple of years, and I think lighting has been driving a lot of that change. Um, Bravis has a full design and engineering department. 
Um, so we do offer upfront design engineering services. We're a little selfish because we anticipate or expect that that business is going to come our way once we complete that design. Um, but it doesn't always, right? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes you only buy some of what we've recommended. Um, but that's a great uh, foray into that conversation. And there's a lot of companies I'm finding popping up across the country now that are not part of Bravis, that are just guys who are in the industry or that are engineers or designers from the commercial trade. Who just do design. Who just do design. So yeah. just like you'd find a lighting yeah. designer, you'll find a tech design yeah. group. And they don't install anything. They don't service anything. They generate the plans. They work with the homeowner. They come up with the designs. Uh, just like an architect would, and it goes out to a contractor for bidding and installation. And I think if that approach is done properly, um, some of the cost for the integrator comes out because the integrator is no longer designing anymore. They're no longer you know, writing up parts lists. Um, if somebody came to me and handed me a completed design and said, just install this, it would be a whole lot less expensive for me to do that than to take my design team and apply them to it and figure it out. Yeah. Sarah, what were some of the, uh, what were some of the technology, what, what technologies were most eye-opening or notable that were introduced to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the lighting was really blew my mind. I mean, there was just so much around. And it just, it all made sense when everything was presented to me from AV to lighting to have all one system in one place. I was like, okay, that, again, it's, there's an investment in that, but it's worth it, right? Like that to me made, you know, to have one central sort of system. Um, but I think lighting was probably the biggest, most eye-opening. And I remember having this conversation with Vince and, I mean, complimentary, kudos to him, because he, he did in the beginning when we sat down, he's like, I really think you need to get your team together. Like, you, you made that a priority, and we, and we did do that. But, and I remember you saying, like, lighting is and can be very expensive, and there are a lot of different options. And so I was really blown away by, and again, just sort of the detail around, it's not, you just throw up a bunch of schlocky lights and pray for the best, it's like there's actually like a lot of design and consideration into lighting, and that's really was important to me. So um, that was something I think, you know, Sean has been super helpful with. Cool. Was there tech, what, was there tech that um, didn't float your boat? What was, what was anything that you said, oh uh, yeah, I can't, that's not. Um, no, because I want all of it. Like, yeah. <laughs> she wants it all. <laughs> I, want, I wanted the Cadillac package. I want yeah. like all the AV. I want all the, you know, the speaker systems. Um, uh, yeah, so I, it, I, it's all impressive to me. Um, it's just, is it, you know, can I afford it? Right, <laughs> that's, right, the, right. that's the question. But if it's, Do I not get a pool, right? right, right. <laughs> that's, what, that's sort of what it is. But if you had all those options up front, then you can do the trade-offs. Exactly. It's when exactly. something you like more than something you've chosen earlier that you can't undo, that's Correct. when you fall, fall exactly. apart. And, well, and then Vince the has many times, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Vince has many times before, depending on what the budgets are that he's trying to work with then, if he notice that something like this is very important, and, and let's just say you have a $400,000 budget for your lighting, your AV, your control, your shades, you might say, look, let's let's shave a little bit off the house so we can make this work within your budget. Exactly. You know, knowing that stuff all up front would exactly. help. Exactly. Exactly. Right. We get a we get a lot of requests nowadays for uh, leak detection. We have we have we have hmm. just a few of the uh, the tech things that we're seeing in our market. A lot of leak detection because we're having more and more people traveling and being out of their house for significant amount of, significant amount of time. We've, got, we've had two floods in houses uh, that are in our office right now where we're, we're helping the clients fix it because they, they didn't have little water bugs that could have been in there, you know, so they're immediately on it. We do a lot of, um, we're doing a lot more solar and solar pre-wires and even we've had our first two houses for Tesla tiles. So we're, we're definitely getting into these categories more than we used to. I was thinking about it last night and I, I would say that 10 years ago, one out of every five houses that we were doing in our office had a tech component to it, usually a lighting control component. And now I would say we're probably three out of five. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't be surprised if in two years' mm -hmm. time we're four out of five. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's definitely coming. We have to deal with it. We have to, we have to find a way, our profession mm -hmm. has to find a way to do our jobs, frankly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this shouldn't come as any surprise to you. I just moved myself up earlier in the process. Um, <laughs> okay. And you're pink. <laughs> it was, well, you're per it was purple before. <laughs> it looks pink on this screen. But um, 
Yeah, I want you to make sure you see that. Um, <laughs> I see it. <laughs> really and I think we should probably move the builder over there too, based on your comment. I think that ideally the builder would be up front as well as part of that initial design team. So that's just sort of the, the summary of what we talked about. There's one more slide here, I think. Um, can everybody see that okay? There'll be a quiz on this one later, <laughs> yeah. so study this one up. Um, this is a document that sometimes we put together depending on the complexity of the project, just to say who's responsible for what along the way. Um, we usually don't do this until it's early. And, and the far left column in each color is the technology designer component of it. Um, and, and essentially we touch all of these things on this list at some point as a tech designer. But there's other trades too that have check boxes next to their names, which is where the collaboration has to take place. Um, and that's where these projects either are very successful or very unsuccessful. Um, if we do a good enough job of identifying all the players, what their roles are, who needs to collaborate with who, get as many decisions made and specifications done up front as we possibly can, we can have a very successful project that can move smoothly and we can, we can work uh, not to worry so much about timelines. If we don't do this or we're late to the party and we can't be there early in the process, these things have to be sort of retroactive. And I think that's when it gets really, really challenging. Um, I did throw together some engineering document samples for you. I'm not gonna flip through them. You guys have probably seen a lot of these before, but um, these are the types of documents that we typically provide on a project like this. And again, the earlier the better. The last thing we wanna do is be build, building these uh, uh, drawings the day before we rough in a house or the day after, which would be even worse. Yeah, and my experience too is when you're, you know, do you, do you pull all, well, you're an electrician, um, mm -hmm. so you're pulling all the line voltage in the house too, or you're not doing that? Are you not doing? <laughs> That's an interesting conversation. Um, yeah, typically we would do that. We'd be, as okay. the electrical contractor, we do everything. Because I know that, you know, like if you, you, you go out to bid with an electrical plan and then you start adding wires for the tech as an afterthought, that's not an always fun conversation to have. And the electricians, they, they've got you, they're, I don't want to say they got you, but there's, it's, it's harder to get, negotiate when you're adding things on to the project over that period of time. So get, the plans are important, right? right? So I, I just walked, you know, if you want to just go through quickly these, what, Okay, I mean, I can't see what they are from my eyes are terrible, yeah. but you get the idea. There's floor plans for, for lighting controls and, and AV equipment and probably landscape speakers and things like that. And what is the, like, what is the, so you've got traditional lighting, you've got lighting for products like Ketra, and you've got uh, like a DMX lighting. What's, what's, the, what's the impact and cost of uh, those three technologies to the, the electrical bid? Well, again, I, I think the interesting part isn't so much the impact of the, the cost, it's when it happens. So if there's an integrator, an electrical contractor, and a builder on a project, and the builder came to the project because he bid the job early, he bid to the architect specification. Um, so there were X number of fixtures, there were X number of switches, there may have been or may not have been a lighting control system involved in that bid. There was a number to the builder, and that number went from the builder to the homeowner. There was an expectation of what my electric should cost. And the integrator jumps into the party late and says, oh, we're putting in a whole Lutron lighting control system, we're gonna use color changing fixtures, we're gonna put in all this other stuff. Um, and Mr. Electrician, here's the list of stuff you have to change in your bid. Some are deletions, some are ads, some are just reconfigurations of things. The electrician now has an opportunity, right? <laughs> Which is, I can be a good partner to my builder because it's the guy I work with all the time and I'm gonna take good care of them and be honest about this and tell you exactly how it impacts me. But I can also say, wait a second, this is hard. Right, this right. isn't what I, I can't do this without thinking about it. I've got to spend time on it. Right. Um, in addition to the actual labor and, and material, it's, it's my brain power and my time on the site to make sure I follow the plans that are given me by somebody else. So my price now goes up too. How about the impact on choosing a trimless fixture to the labor to install it and maybe the labor to, to uh, plaster the I ceiling? would ask Greg and, and yeah. Vince about this. I mean, is that so, so Greg, I mean, from a builder standpoint, trimless fixtures, I believe they're a little more labor to install, a little more effort in the plastering. Is that a, is that a, a bigger issue? Yeah, I, I, look, I guess it, it depends on the size and the number of fixtures, but a lot of those things are still getting roughed in at the same point. Yeah. Um, it, it's no different from, you know, Vince and I had a conversation a week ago about how we were going to trim windows, you know, with return jams or, um, you know, returning the drywall or using wood, you know, a lot of that, as long as it's roughed in, it does take a little bit more time. I mean, every builder in that room knows what a roto zip is and what damage it does to lights and everything. So it, it's going to require the, the hangers and the finishers to slow down a little bit. And, you know, certainly we'll give them an opportunity to put more money in their bid to, to finish it. So, but so from the a process builder, isn't yeah. really different. 
So from a builder's, I'm going to shift gears a slightly. From a builder's standpoint, um, when you get into some of the newer technology, let's take Windows, for example, and now you've got Windows that tint for UV protection or privacy. Uh, you've got shades in between Windows, and some of the, there's technology in there. Where, where, uh, where is the intersection of the integrator versus the, you know, the, you and whoever's going to hang a smart door or a smart window? How do, how do you bridge the gap there? I mean, in my past, it was always late. Um, you know, I have a client that actually both Sean and Sarah know that, you know, he didn't think about the shades. He's right down on the water in Baltimore City. Didn't think about the shades early on. His designers didn't uh, drive him in the right direction. Uh, and we had the whole house drywalled before he decided, so we put battery-powered shades in. And they were loud. They were bulky. They they just they looked terrible. And you know, then we had to go back in after the fact, after the whole house was done, because by the time you measure new shades, get them manufactured, he's living in the house at this point. So now we make Swiss cheese out of his house again to run low voltage wiring to control, you know, Lutron shades. And we also had a door in there to his master suite that was a steel fabricated door with glass that we had the tenting on it where you hit a remote and it, it um, frosts the glass. Same thing, we had the entire door fabricated before it ever came to them. Oh, we, we ought to do this. And then we had to turn on, take all the glass back out. We had to drill, you know, tiny holes everywhere to run control wires to every single glass panel. I mean, it was just yeah. torturous. Yeah. Um, getting somebody in to go over all those, as Sean said earlier, 85 pages of different things for them to consider, I think is, is huge. Um, and again, it benefits the builder. He's going to make more profit on more items in the, in the house. It's going to help the installer. Uh, the integrator is going to make a portion on it. I mean, and, and the homeowner is going to get what they want. Right. So yeah, I definitely think it needs okay. to come in much, much earlier because there's only so much Vince and I know. And the technology is changing so fast. I I can't begin to bother myself with, you know, more than trying to stay on top of the sticks and bricks of building the house. Uh, Vince and I are finishing a, a project that's been going on for over five years. It's a 22,000 square foot house when it's all done. And this client wants the best of everything in his house and you know we put first generation ketras in the house and then the technology changed sean you can correct me if i'm wrong the technology changed after after the first phase as we got towards the end so then we had to consider are we going to rip out every single ketra fixture in the house or you know and now drywall work paint work um you know right. are we gonna put different bulbs in that that work right. and um he wanted to control everything with his smartphone. He travels the world frequently, so he wanted to be able to handle everything at his house by his phone. We had the leak detections everywhere. Um, yeah. huh. I mean, so, so Sarah, what advice? You're at a cocktail party, and you meet someone who's about to endeavor on a project like this. What do you tell them about your experience to encourage them to do something that you think they'll benefit. I mean, first I would refer everyone around here because I have a great team, <laughs> right. but I do. I'm really fortunate. I hired really good people. And and honestly, that that is kind of the lesson is that- well, Hire good people, number hire one. Hire good people, but also like, I'm looking to you for you to help tell me what I, not what I need to do, but make suggestions. And so as part of the process, I'm a very sort of linear process oriented person and that's why I loved when Vince kind of gave me that document and said here's the process and involvement because there are so many moving parts um, and again I you know beating the uh, horse here but um, just having the conversation I think early about all the considerations on tech and AV I think would have been so go early and so what advice what would you tell a builder who had a client and the builder thought that things weren't being addressed early enough. What could they say to the client that didn't sound like, that would encourage the client to act so hard. in a positive way? I mean, I, I, again, I'm in the customer service business too, so it's very hard to have these conversations. You're, they're your client, right? And even though you may know what they need or what they need help with, or it may be outside of their budget, and they ha you have to sort of deliver that news to someone, 
I mean, I think the, the best thing that you can do, and I think Vince was alluding to this, is just you don't know what you don't know, right? And the minute that you own that and you just say, like, this is not my area of expertise, but there are people that do have it, and I'm going to lean on them, and or, you know, it, it's not going to turn out the way that you want it to, and I'm just going to be transparent with you. Like, your budget's not going to support that. That's not right. your fault. That's not Greg's fault. That's not Sean's fault. It's just transparency throughout the process, I think, is is a big thing, and then secondarily is just, again, you're like, they're, if you're in over your skis, just tell me, and you know, that's just not, you didn't hire me to do that. This is my role, this is my lane, this is what I will help you with, but if you want this, then you need this. Yeah, yeah, really, okay. Greg, Vince, Sean, any other last comments? I think you should build a practice house. Like, do one first, see how it goes, and so. Are you go. suggesting that's my house? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Are you going to pay right. for it? <laughs> All right. Well, first of all, thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your experiences. Vince and Greg, appreciate your participation. And Sean, as always, thanks for sponsoring this session. Um, we have another minute. Any, any, any questions or thoughts before we wrap it up? Yeah, Greg. It's important for, whoa, I don't need that. <laughs> the trust pass package is important for uh, shading, but really important for lighting and the reflective ceiling plants. So does the lighting designer or whomever work around the trusses, or do we work the trusses around the RCP? Most, most of our lighting consultants that we work with are knowledgeable enough that they, they can actually be part of that conversation when they're looking at a framing plan. You know, they know what they're looking at, and they, they can even make suggestions to us about turning the framing for this or that. But honestly, the architects, I think, are, are the ones, you know, that usually start that process because I know in our case, the engineer works for us. So we have a, a nice fluid relationship and communication, you know, about turning things, making things shallower. But uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, I mean, how many, 10 years ago, I, we always used to mislocate recessed cans and we always used to have bad shade pocket problems. And I think that's one of the things that's getting much better, at least in our market. The architects are really starting to, to take a, a concerted effort at not screwing that up. All right, yeah, thank you, everybody. You, you, this uh, concludes this morning's session. Uh, next step, you'll find your group leader outside, and you've got your boardrooms. Our next presentation at lunch is in the high-volume room. It's, it's uh, with the high-volume builders, uh, the big seven, so it won't be in here. It'll be next door. And uh, I'd like to thank everyone, the panelists, and Sean and Brabus. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Good job.